This is the story of Pan Am Flight 759. On the 9th of July 1982, it was a rainy overcast day and a Pan Am 727 Flight 759 was flying from Miami to Las Vegas with a stopover in New Orleans. At 3.38 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the 727 left the gate with 145 people on board. As the pilots taxied away, they listened to the ATIS messages, scattered clouds at 2,500 feet, six miles of visibility, and calm winds coming in from 240 degrees. The overcast sky looked like it might give them some trouble, but so far it was relatively calm. As the plane started its taxi, the pilots calculated some important metrics for the takeoff. The engines were to be set at a power setting of around 1.90, and the B1 and B2 speeds were at 131 and 158 knots, respectively. The crew requested runway 10, and the tower cleared them to use the same. Clipper 759 was about to start her second leg for the day towards Las Vegas. At 3.59 p.m., the co-pilot asked for a wind check. Ground control lets them know that they have an 8-knot wind coming in from 040 degrees. Nothing too major, nothing that the 727 could not handle. As the plane taxied, the pilots toiled away in the cockpit. The radio buzzed in the background. Some planes had experienced some issues with wind shear in the northern quadrant of the airport. At 4.03 p.m., the co-pilot requested another wind check. Control lets them know that wind was at 070 degrees at 17 knots and gusting to 23 knots. With wind shear alerts going off in all quadrants of the airport, it was now more windy than when they started out. It appeared that they were in the middle of a weather system. The captain advises the co-pilot to, quote, let the speed build up on takeoff. The captain even suggested that they turn off the air conditioning packs so that they would have extra thrust from the engines on takeoff. At 4.06 p.m. and 22 seconds, Clipper 759 was ready to go. Two seconds later, the tower cleared them for takeoff. As the pilots completed their pre-takeoff checklist, the radio in the cockpit crackled to life with a transmission from a landing Eastern Airlines airplane. They had reported a 10-knot wind shear on the final approach onto runway 10. At 4.07 p.m., the plane was rolling down the runway, picking up speed. The captain called out rotate and V2 as the plane continued its takeoff. The plane lifted off 7,000 feet down the runway and the plane climbed, wings level to about 150 feet, and then to the shock of onlookers, Flight 759 began to descend. The initial climb was normal. Flight 759 looked like any other 727 on takeoff, but as the plane began to descend, the nose slightly pitched up. With the nose up about 7 to 10 degrees, it was clear that Flight 759 was clawing for altitude. And then Flight 759 runs out of altitude and crashes into a residential neighborhood, killing 154 people on board and 8 people on the ground. The plane struck the ground about 2,300 feet from the end of the runway. The plane started striking the tops of the trees with the left wing about 2 to 3 degrees down. The plane rolled to the left and then continued on, finally coming to rest almost 4,000 feet from the runway. The wreckage told them a lot. The gear was retracted and the flaps were set to 15. The investigators scoured the now shattered cockpit and found that the EPR gauges were at 1.90 for engines 1 and 3 and engine number 2 on the tail was at 2.90. The plane had plenty of thrust when it crashed. The investigators looked at the weather to see if it played a part in the crash. It was raining at the time and rain can affect the plane adversely. Rains affect the plane, but not in the way that you think. In the case of Taka Airlines Flight 110, a heavy downpour sent so much water into the engines that they flamed out. That's how most people would expect rain to affect the airplane. But here, the investigators looked at a few ways in which rain might have affected the plane. First, when rain hits the airplane, it sticks to the plane for a few moments. This can cause the plane's takeoff weight to increase. Had the plane been near its maximum takeoff weight, this would have been an issue. Secondly, the raindrops can steal momentum away from the airplane. When the raindrops strike the plane, the plane's momentum gets transferred to the raindrops. 
And lastly, the raindrops can roughen up the surface of the wing by forming a thin film of water that can disrupt the airflow and reduce lift generated by the wings. They decide to do the math on all these scenarios. The rain would only increase the weight of the plane by 1-2%. to 2%. This, in the grand scheme of things, is negligible. Scenario 1 is ruled out. The second scenario where the raindrops steal away momentum from the plane is more plausible. With the plane in takeoff configuration, that is with the flaps and gear down, the plane is going to intercept a lot more droplets. At a rain intensity of about 500 mm per hour, the plane could lose about 1.5 knots of airspeed to the rain per second. But during the takeoff roll, the rainfall was calculated to be about 144 mm per hour, not enough to slow the plane down by a significant margin. The last scenario is the one where the rain disrupts the airflow. When the plane is taking off in this scenario, the thin water film develops ripples on the wing due to the wind and due to other raindrops hitting the wing. They found that a thin film like this would increase drag by about 10 to 20%. They also found that this drag penalty increases as the angle of attack increases. However, all these conclusions were theoretical and was based on a NASA research paper. No one had actually taken a plane out in the rain to measure these factors, as it would have been too risky. The values used in NASA's calculations were conservative and realistic. The last point has too many variables, and some senior scientists said that a bit of roughness in the wing in a very specific condition could have beneficial effects as well. The raid may have played a small part in the crash, but it certainly did not bring Flight 759 down. The investigators looked at the general weather next, but to understand their findings, let's walk through a few terms really quickly. So at least in those days, cloud density was measured with the help of radar. So the more voluminous and dense a cloud is, the stronger the radar return. This is represented on a VIP scale, where VIP1 refers to a weak echo and light precipitation, and VIP6 refers to extreme echo and heavy precipitation. On the day of the accident, a radar station in Slidell, Louisiana was observing the departure end of runway 10. The radar station observed a VIP2 cell at the end of the runway, and another VIP2 cell 4 nautical miles east of the airport. However, due to the attenuation of the returning radar signal, it's more likely that these were level 3 storm cells. As the plane took off, we have two level 3 storm cells near the airport and one over the runway. Moreover, four planes between 4 p.m. and 4.09 p.m. observed multiple storm cells over and near the airport. Looking at the wind data, the investigators find something interesting. When the plane took off, the center field wind sensor detected about 16 knots of wind from 060 degrees. This means that Flight 759 had a lot of headwind as they took off. But at the time of the crash, witnesses saw trees swaying in the wind near the crash site. This means that there was quite a strong 30 knot gust at the tree line near the crash site. Assuming that this wind was coming in from 310 degrees, the net result of all these winds meant that Flight 759 would have lost about 40 knots of headwind from takeoff to impact. Headwind is super important when you're taking off. If you have a headwind, you have more wind flowing over your wings and that means more lift. But the data shows something else as well. As the plane took off, the VIP3 convective cells started a divergent flow, or in simpler terms, there was a microburst nearby. The simplest way to think of a microburst is to think of water from a faucet hitting the sink. You have a column of water that is spread out in all directions once it hits the sink. A microburst is exactly like that, but with air instead of water. The microburst was centered at about 700 feet north of runway 10. The plane avoided the worst of the microburst, but it wreaked havoc on the winds near the runway. Calculations showed that at an altitude of about 100 feet above the ground, the plane would have experienced a downdraft of about 7 feet per second. This means that wind moving at 7 feet per second was pushing down on the plane as it struggled with the reduced headwind. But could the plane have been saved? Boeing and the NTSB simulated about 13 scenarios with different conditions to see if the plane could have been saved. 
Scenario 3 stands out to the investigators. In Scenario 3, had the pilots utilized the plane's upward momentum to maintain their altitude, they could have held the plane at 95 feet long enough to outlast the winds. Going back to the crash site, it's clear that the pilots fought till the very last second. The trees show that the plane was barely descending or it might have started to climb as it hit the trees. Had the pilots reacted more quickly to the wind shear and the microburst, it's possible that they might have been able to save the plane. It just took them too long to realize what was happening. It wasn't easy for the pilots to detect that they were in a microburst event. Usually when you encounter a microburst, your speed shoots up due to the headwind coming off the microburst, and then you enter the center of the microburst where you experience downdrafts, and then you experience a tailwind as you exit the microburst. They took off right into a microburst, so it would have been really hard for them to figure out that they were in a microburst, and also since they were taking off, they were at the mercy of the winds and quite slow. Had the 727 had an onboard wind shear radar, this accident would have been preventable. The captain did check his onboard radar, but it could not show him the danger ahead. The airport systems only detected the wind shear from the microburst after the plane had taken off, by which time it was too late. You cannot really fault the crew on this one. With the information that the captain had at the time he took his decision, the decision to continue the takeoff was the right one. But unfortunately, the aviation industry did not learn from its mistakes. It would take another microburst-related crash in the form of Delta Airlines Flight 191 to spur the industry to action. After that crash, they developed the Airborne Wind Shear Detection and Alert System, and the FAA mandated that wind shear detection systems be installed at airports and on aircraft by the year 1993. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. A big thank you to everyone who contributed to the footage of today's video. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe. Wash your hands.